Well, I'm glad to be here tonight. We are so sorry that we were not able to have service last night. Uh, the weather would just not permit the internet to work properly. And about the time that we were going to have service, the tornado warnings were here. So we felt for you to be safer, for you to be in your homes. And I am just glad to be with you tonight. Uh, Jen, good to see you. Oh, Shirley, may God bless you. Lexi, good to see you tonight. Uh, Jen, we love you, appreciate you. Uh, Ms. Gail, God bless you. So good to see you guys tonight. I'm going to give a few moments for others to get on. Maria, how are you tonight? Enjoying your devotions, enjoying them. Listen, while we're waiting for a few others to get on, let me just give you a praise report. We have, we have had some phone calls that we've been given the last couple of weeks and just talking to people, checking to see how they're doing. Every person I call today, without exception, 100%, was so upbeat, so excited about what was going on in their life, what was going on in their family's lives, and was just excited that what God was doing. I'm telling you, you can make a good situation out of this bad situation that we're in right now. You can have quality family time. You can have memories that you can make with children, grandchildren, through Zoom, through FaceTime. So use this time to be very creative with your family. And so as we get ready tonight to go back to the book of Mark, chapter 2, I've enjoyed the study. And when I first started, we were just using a few scriptures at a time, and I realized and I'm going, to just, I'm going to be very transparent. I realized that there were people watching or would be watching that did not know the Lord as their personal Savior. So I went back and just started looking at it from a little different direction and said, you know what? I want to just minister to them. I want to give a little depth in it. But I want to give it in such a way that anybody can pick it up, anybody can watch it and hear the gospel message. So... If you'll pick up your Bibles tonight to the book of Mark, chapter 2. Good to see you, Robbie, Brother Broadhead, WT, Pam. May God bless you guys. Yes, good to see you guys. Bless y'all so much. Mark, chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And again, he entered into Capernaum. And after some days, it was noise that he was there. Now, this is, he's gone back to Simon Peter's house. Remember where he healed mother-in-law? He's back there. So Mark chapter 2, verse 1, he went back, and he went back to Capernaum the certain days, and when it was noise that he was in the house. Straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. Now this happened last time. And when it happened last time, he was there all evening after the, after the Sabbath, and he was healing people throughout the night. Then he left and went into Galilee. So now it picks it back up that he's back, and it says that they that he preached the word unto them. Again, he's preaching from the house. And Mark chapter two, verse three, and they come unto him, bring one sick of the palsy, which was born of four, carried by four people. And when this one comes, now where he comes from, we're not quite sure, because if you'll go back and remember a moment, we said that there was almost everybody in Capernaum was healed. So there are others that are now being brought into this city with the chance that they'll meet the Savior the healer that has come. So they bring him as Jesus is sitting in there preaching, they come in. So Mark immediately changes the whole thought process and concentrates upon this one central person. Now understand, there's been a lot of preaching going on to this point. There's been a lot of healing that is happening. But Mark is going to now dwell upon this one situation. So Mark chapter 2, picking it back up, in verse 3, and I'm going to read through verse 12, and then we'll look through it. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. When they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. When they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, all of them, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son, or individual, thy sins be forgiven thee. There were certain of the scribes sitting there, and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he turned and he said unto them, 
Why reason you these things in your heart? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on the earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto you thee, Arise, take up thy bed, go thy way to thine own house. And immediately he arose, took up his bed, went forth before them all, insomuch they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We've never saw it on this fashion. Now, I, I've, I notice that Brother Broadhead is on here and other ones that are preaching and teaching. And, and, and I see, April, you're here. This is one of those passages that very quick as a pastor will preach this text. It just gives absolutely all the points you want for salvation, all the points you want for healing, all the points that you want for ministries of helps in the church. So there's a lot of different angles that you can come from this. Something to me that has always been very interesting, we don't know any of their individuals' names. The ones that carried the sick man of palsy and this man that was sick. The other thing is, we really don't know how long, except from birth more than likely, he had these things. And we find a lot of different things in God's word. And a lot of times when we're looking at this, we need to stop and say, okay, can I find these questions to these type of answers? And that's what you start looking for. Jesus had been in Capernaum, had went to Galilee. Remember when he was in Galilee, he healed the leper. And because he healed the leper, he had to leave the city or the surrounding area of Galilee, and he went into the outskirts of the towns. Well, now he has come back to Capernaum. If you're reading this, you think, well, he just goes from Galilee straight back. Can I remind you? that I said to you last week, that if all the miracles were recorded in God's word, the books would not be large enough to contain them. So just because it says he went from Galilee to Capernaum and we only see the healing of the leper and we see the healing of the palsy does not mean that in between miracles were occurring. There were many miracles that occurred wherever Jesus went, miracles were happening. So he heals the leper. So now he comes back and here he is sitting and he's back in Capernaum and he's preaching. The crowd has gathered. He's actually teaching in the crowd. Now it's going to be some scribes. It's going to be, you're going to find Pharisees starting to show up. You're going to see people coming from Jerusalem, coming from other areas. And they're, they're questioning this healer this man that is doing the miracles, this man that is saying that he, that he can, that sins can be forgiven. So as Jesus is healing and as he's preaching, the setting kind of changes direction. So the men walk up and they cannot get in the house. So look with me, if you would, in the book of Luke chapter five, verse 18. Luke 5, 18. Let me give you a moment to look at it. Behold, the men brought in a bed a man which was taken with palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before Jesus. And when they could not find that by what they were might bring him in because of the multitude, they went up on the roof, on the housetop, and let him down through the tiling, which, he, which his couch in the midst or right in the middle or right in front of where Jesus was sitting. Now, let me give you some explanation here to me that's almost comical. A Jewish, Jewish house typically had a flat roof with a stair step going up the outside. It was built with large wooden beams, smaller pieces of wood, and between that was thatch consisting of grain, twigs, straw, mud. So these individuals crawl up, walk up on this roof with this man, and literally start digging a hole in the roof to lower this man with palsy down in front of Jesus. Now, I'm going to just go ahead and tell you, I've had a lot of distractions in church. I've had children move. I've had people get up. I've had uh, fire alarms go off. I've had different things happen. 
And a lot of times I can honestly, and if you know me, I can really block them out pretty good. I usually can tell you after church how many people's gone to the bathroom and how many times they've gone. It's just something subconsciously that I can do. But I cannot imagine the atmosphere with Jesus sitting there in that house teaching, and as he's teaching, the roof is literally being torn off. Dirt's falling in, the straw's falling in, the stones are falling in, the rocks and the wood. And then all at once, the hole just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And before you know it, now there's man lowered right down in front of Jesus. They wouldn't let him in the door. So the friends did not give up till they put him right down in front of Jesus. So with that, the whole setting changes. Everyone in the room, their attention is then drawn to what's coming out of the ceiling. They say, no, pastor, their, their attention was upon Jesus. Let me tell you something. In a large congregation setting, when something disruptive is happening, everybody pays attention to that disruption. So because of that, yeah, they, they should have had security in there. Because of this, as he's being lowered into this room, he then becomes the single attention of everybody in the room, of Jesus, of all that are sitting there. And he now becomes the main person that we're going to talk about in the text. Because as they lowered him down, Jesus does not say what's wrong, does not ask him if he needs to be healed. The very question, first question out of the mouth of the Savior is, your sins are forgiven. Go back and look at it. Mark chapter 2 Verse 5, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. When this happens, you have to understand something very simple. Jesus is upon this earth, yes, to heal the sick. But I've said it to you before, and I'll say it to you again here tonight. His number one priority was to seek and save that which is lost. He had come to redeem the spirit man. And in this text, we find this man of the palsy being lowered down. And it's, you know, you want to look at this and say, it's the faith of the four that brought him. It's the faith of him that brought him. But can I say this? The conversation went directly to that individual, directly to the man with the palsy. He said to him, son, your sins be forgiven you. Now, let me give you some very simple thoughts here for your understanding. At that time, in any physical sickness that anyone had, everybody assumed it was sin, that they had sinned in their life. I want to remind you again tonight, the sin happened in the Garden of Eden. And because of the consequences of sin, then that man was affected and you and I are affected. Because of that, that he looks at him and he says, your sins be forgiven you. He is talking about salvation. He's not talking about that there is something sinful in your life, and that's the reason you have the palsy. He literally said to him, you do not know Jesus Christ. You do not know me, and you do not know the Father as you should. Your sins be forgiven you. Look with me, if you would, back in the text, Mark chapter 2, and let's pick it up at verse 6. His declaration of forgiveness gave the hostile religious leaders there the first ammunition that they're going to use, and they're going to start using this against Jesus from this point forward. You're going to find that they're trying to find some way to stop this man that is doing the miraculous, that is doing the miracles. So in Mark chapter 2, verse 6, there were certain of the scribes sitting there and they reasoned in their heart. You ever look at somebody and know that they don't know really what's going on in front of them and they're just trying to figure it out? They have this puzzled look and they're trying to put the whole thing together. Well, 
They started reasoning in their heart how they could stop this man. What doth this man thus speak blaspheming? They were hearing when he said, thy sins be forgiven thee. The moment Jesus says that, their whole attention was that he was blaspheming God. They're not going to see that his sins are going to be forgiven. And they're not, even though they're physically seeing that he is going to get up and walk away and be healed, they're not seeing it. They're still blind to it because the whole thing was he's blaspheming God. And they get so caught up in that that they miss what's happening right in front of them. So the Bible says in Mark chapter 2, picking it back at verse 8, and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit they were reasoning among themselves, he then turns to the scribes. I find this interesting. He gives them attention and he says to them, why reason ye these things in your heart? He literally calls them out. He is telling us here that yes, he is the son of God, but he knows all things. And he knew in their heart, not only by their physical actions, but he knew the spirit about them. Now I've made a very simple statement a lot of times behind the pulpit when I'm closing the service and I will say to you that I sense the Lord dealing with people. Well, let me give you some very simple understanding of that tonight. One, I didn't fall off a turnip truck yesterday. There's some people that you can literally see sin in their face. You can see how they squirm. You can see how they're restless during the closing of the service. You can see how the movement, how their face, their eyes, they're wanting to get away from it. The other thing that you sense a lot of times is you sense in your spirit. But their spirit is not bearing witness with what you're talking about, and they're being brought under conviction. You ever been standing in front of somebody and talking to them about Jesus and all at once their eyes just missed over and tear up? You know without a shadow of a doubt that they know that God's dealing with them. In this instance, the scribes, I think their body language was saying volumes, but I think also we know who Jesus was. And we know that he was all-knowing, and he saw this. And because of that, he says to them in verse 9 of Mark chapter 2, Is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? Now, he's not asking them a question. He's literally looking at them and saying, Okay, there's two things that I can do here. I can say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, and... It's a heart thing between him and me and God, and you can't see that. Or can I say also that, he's, that he stands up and walks, and you see that divine miracle, and you see where he physically gets up and walks. So what he says, he says, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power over earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way in thine own house. And immediately he gets up, and he walks off joyfully. God granted full forgiveness of sin, and because God grants full forgiveness of sin, and Jesus being the Son of God, he says, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Jesus could not forgive him of his sins. Only God the Father could. Let me show you a scripture in the Psalms to show you this, and then we'll move back to the text. Psalms chapter 51, verse 4. Psalms 51, verse 4. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Let me make a very clear understanding to you here. I can lead you to Jesus Christ. Jesus died on behalf of your sins and my sins. I can lead you, but I cannot. I cannot lead you. I cannot grant you salvation that only comes from the Father through the Son. We've got too many people in this world that think preachers can give salvation or that 
joining churches creates salvation or being baptized creates salvation. Brothers and sisters, it's through the blood and through the offering of a living Savior, Jesus Christ, that died upon the cross, rose again, ascended to the right hand of the Father. And because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. And only through the Son do we go to the Father. And then the Father gives us that forgiveness. Understand, we have so many people that misunderstand salvation. Understand with me, going to church is not salvation. Living a good life is not salvation. Accepting what Christ did on the cross and asking Jesus to come into your heart and living a life that knowing that you were sinning against God is the only thing that brings salvation to you and I. It's a very simple way of looking at it. But the scribes now realize they have Jesus and they have him on three different things here. And I find this very interesting. First, they're going to charge Jesus with blasphemy because he spoke evil of the law of God, but he didn't. That's one of the charges that they're going to start conjuring up. The second one is a little more serious that they're going to now start using and trying to manipulate it in such a way, and that is that blasphemy occurred when he spoke evil of God, but Jesus never spoke evil of God. So they're not going to be able to use this. He is not going to curse the Lord's name. He is not going to take God's name in any type of vein or anything like that. But the third one that they're going to use, and you're going to hear this multiple times through the scribes and through the Pharisees, and that one is that when he claims to have authority and equality with God, when he says, I am the Son of God, there is where the scribes are going to now start building a case against Jesus. It's going to go to the Pharisees. It's going to start building. And because of this, they're going to say it's a form of blasphemy. And they're going, the religious leaders are now going to start following Jesus. And every time he makes these type statements, it's just going to build a flame in their anger towards him. Can I remind you of a scripture in the book of John chapter 19, verse 7? When Jesus is standing in front of Pilate and he's standing there and he's going through all the things that are happening, I want you to listen to what they said in John 19, 7. The Jews answered and said, we have a law and by our law, we ought to, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. He did not make himself. He was the son of God. And I want you to understand because of that, that statement there, here at the man of the palsy, it is now going to start building against Jesus. And Jesus is going to say, you know, I read your minds. I kind of realized what you were doing because I, I realized what, what's taking place. And I see your body language and I see things that are happening. And he is then going to call them out by not only forgiving the man or telling the man that his sins are forgiven, but he's also going to heal the man, the palsy man. And because of this, when he does this, he literally shows them that he is the healer, okay? And some things take place in Mark chapter 2, verse 12. And immediately he arose and took up the bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were amazed and glorified God, saying, we've never saw it on this fashion. They've never seen anybody work in the spiritual realm like Jesus was working. Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit without measure. Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus is going to do miraculous things. He is going to heal he is going to do supernatural things, but still the greatest thing that happens in this man's life is that his sins were forgiven him. Whenever Jesus healed anybody, it was a complete healing. Now we understand there's a few places where he literally touches a man's eyes twice. But I want you to understand, and sometimes we, we miss something 
This man of the palsy did not have to get up and learn how to walk. He did not get up and stumble around. But Mark chapter 2, verse 12, And immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We've never seen it on this fashion. He literally was rejoicing. Go with me to the book of Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verse 25. Same story, but let me give you a little more detail. Luke 5, 25, 26. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. I don't think this man just got up, folded his bed, and walked away. I think it was a shouting, running, jumping, hollowing. I think that every person he passed, he grabbed them, he showed them their, his bed, they knew who he was. I, I, and the story does not tell us what the four did. But can I just give you my simple thoughts? I think the four were running right behind him just as hard, talking about what God had done, how Jesus had healed him, and, and the Bible says in Luke 5, 26, and when they were all amazed, they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have never, we've seen strange things today. I think it's sad that in the 21st century, that when miracles occur in America in the modern day traditional church, Pentecostal, non-Pentecostal, doesn't matter. When a miracle occurs, people walk away saying we've seen strange things today. Folks, it's not strange. It's Jesus. I've made this statement many times. We have not seen the supernatural so much that when it does occur, we think it's strange. We ought to be living in the supernatural and seeing the miracles and seeing the healings and seeing God provide and God do miracles. We ought to be seeing that so much that the supernatural becomes natural. It shouldn't be something that's strange. It shouldn't be something that we've not seen before, we've not perceived before. But I think it ought to be common and natural for us to see miracles and to see the things happening and know that God is in complete control. The Bible says that they were all amazed. And, and I want you to I want you to understand something with me. It says they were all filled with fear and said, We've seen remarkable, amazing things today. In the last couple of weeks, I want to be very transparent with you for just a moment. Regardless of what you think about what's going on with COVID-19. You have seen divine miracles. There have been people staying on respirators longer than we've ever known. We have seen them walk or be taken out of hospitals. We've seen them go home. Now, we're not, we're not seeing that because it's still strange to the world. Miracles are still strange. When men and women write people off, God's not through. Somebody's praying. Somebody's doing something. Jesus is doing miracles. There are healings that are taking place. There are literally thousands of people today walking upon this community and the communities around us that have gone through all of this, and they are supernaturally moving around, and God has intervened. It's not strange. It's Jesus. But because Jesus is not giving the privilege and the opportunity to do the miraculous, we think it's strange. Let me make it very simple. It's not strange if it's your son or your daughter or your mother or your father or if it's you or if it's me, O oh Lord, standing or sitting or lying in the need of prayer. It's not strange. It's not supernatural. It's Jesus. It's miraculous. Thy sins be forgiven thee? Yes, I need my sins to be forgiven. 
You need your sins to be forgiven. We need, we need our sinful nature to be forgiven. But also Jesus has come to do miracles, signs and wonders, so that those that are lost will know that there's still a Savior in this world today. I truly believe that Jesus is alive and well and doing supernatural miracles all around us today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you today that for a very simple few moments we have studied your book. For someone to be so, so moved to take someone up on a bed, up on a roof, tear the roof down to get them in front of Jesus. God, may we be that way in our prayer life. May we be so moved to see people change for your glory that we will do whatever it takes to get them to Jesus. Whatever it takes for them to know you as their personal Savior, may we not give up when the crowds come. May we not give up when the press is there, but may we press through and find a new way to break through so that we can get them into your presence. Lord, would you go with all of us and continue to be with us and give us peace? In thy name we pray, amen and amen. And may God richly bless you and may the Lord enjoy, may you enjoy this afternoon. God bless.